All right. Uh, so this is a project that uh, I guess the, the basis for a lot of you have, have seen in the other sessions, the reasons that we're interested in, in uh, monitoring for induced seismicity hazard uh, have been explained in previous talks. Uh, so this talk, uh, th this presentation is a collection of work that's being done at Lawrence Livermore National Lab to try to advance the science that allows us to characterize um, an in a, 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 excuse me, a, a site where they're injecting into the subsurface that could potentially cause an induced earthquake. We want to be able to get the, the most measurables we can out of the seismic data or out of the uh, geophysical data that we have. Um, so just as the, the basis for this, um, injecting fluids into the subsurface can tri trigger significant earthquakes. I think we've seen several talks about that already in the previous session. Uh, and the key thing here is typically activating a hidden fault, something people didn't know about, didn't know that was a risk. Uh, that's the main concern. So what we want to do is uh, identify those, uh, those faults before uh, the pressure field uh, approaches them uh, and have some forewarning of how the pressure field is evolving. Um, so this image here is just a, an image of Paradox Valley just showing you a, a sense of what uh, 20 years of micro seismicity at, at an injection site looks like. Um, and it's very scattered and, and uh, uh, randomized. Um, and then uh, one of my coworkers has drawn hypothetical, maybe this is a fault, lines on it. And so what we want to do is really characterize these locations much better, characterize the seismicity much better, because this is our, w one of our key views into what's going on on the subsurface is what's actually happening with this uh, micro seismicity. So the key to, to this particular presentation is measurements on the micro seismicity, what, what can we get determined from that and how can we improve it? <clears throat> so the actual field area that we'll be looking at is the Newbury Volcano uh, Enhanced Geothermal Site. Uh, that's a, 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 a EGS system, uh, exper ex experimental uh, system uh, near the Newbury volcano. Uh, they've got uh, 25 instruments uh, right just uh, ar around the site. Uh, that uh, figure here, right over here, is roughly five kilometers uh, laterally across and, and up and down, so to give you a, a sense of the scale. Um, and they've got uh, quite a number of uh, broadband and uh, 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 broadband instruments. And this figure here, oh, thank you, oops, is, uh, is the catalog seismicity uh, related to the injection. And you see a couple of sites of uh, seismicity that are related to the injection uh, during October, of 2000, October to uh, December of 2012. And now one of the first things we want to do uh, at this and any other site is to maximize the amount of uh, micro seismicity that we have to work with. Uh, and one of the ways we do that is to try to push down the limit of uh, the, the uh, completeness catalog, uh, push down the magnitudes to which we can see. And, and one of the ways we do this is using what we call the match field processing technique. It was developed uh, by Dave Harris and is in great use at our, our lab at the moment. Um, and basically, it takes a template here. This is an earthquake or a microquake that was seen at the site and uses this as a template to try to identify other similar uh, smaller magnitude events. And here's an example of a smaller magnitude event that correlates with this, uh, but would not necessarily have been picked or located by, by an individual because it's hard to pick the, uh, the actual uh, PNS phases. Uh, and beyond that, we want to refine these locations. We really want to collapse down where this micro seismicity is because the, the better we can do that, the better we can define any faults. Uh, any structures that might be uh, affecting how the, the pressure field evolves in the subsurface. So uh, here is a technique, uh, Bayes-Loke, developed by uh, Gardar Johansson and Steve Myers, uh, which locates in a Bayesian fashion all of the events in a system relative to one another and relative to the surface to try to get a complete sense of, of what these geometries are. And this is a typical map you might see of a geothermal field. You see a bunch of points. Here are some shallow events, here are some deeper events. And at this point, somebody might start uh, looking at these and say, what is this linear trend? Is this something I need to be concerned about? Now, one of the things that, probably the, uh, one of the more vital things of the Bayesian location technique is it also gives you an uncertainty estimate that's associated with these locations. And here you can see, uh, so the best fit point might be in the center of this population, but this is the 95% uncertainty interval. Uh, related to this particular data set for this uh, particular site. 
Um, and you can see, so all of those points that we saw a minute ago in the, the steep event could potentially be at the exact same point. You can't differentiate them uh, very well uh, based on the data at hand. And you can separate out two populations, a shallow population and a deeper population, but there's a lot more uh, mixture going on or, or uncertainty going on that you have to deal with before you can uh, fully uh, use the microseismic data. <clears throat> So here's one of, uh, one of uh, the ways that we go about locating these events. One is you could take a 1D uh, reference seism uh, seismic velocity model and say, okay, here's my seismic velocity model. I'll calculate some synthetics and I say, oh, great, if I see a shear arrival there and a P arrival there, I'm, I've got my location down pretty well. Now, this is what actual data look like. And you can see this model is actually for the region. And you can see there's pretty good uh, picks for P's and there's some decent S arrivals. But then you have uh, waveforms like this that have a lot of scattering involved. Um, and you know you probably wouldn't even attempt to pick a, sh a shear arrival on, on that waveform because it's just too com complicated. And it's, it's pretty much ignored. Uh, you can see perhaps that it's actually a very poor fit to this model. So we want to make a better model of the subsurface to see if we can use more of that waveform um, to characterize the subsurface and to characterize the microseismicity itself. So the way we've gone about doing this is using uh, ambient noise correlation, which I expect most people here are familiar with, uh, using the network uh, of stations that was deployed for this experiment, as well as some uh, uh, stations outside to get uh, some deeper velocity structures. Um, and we're able to calculate uh, very detailed, very heterogeneous structures at the site. So this is the shear velocity at 500 meters and two kilometers. At 500 meters, you're seeing variations of 50% from the uh, reddest red to the bluest blue here. So these are very heterogeneous structures, and it's even more heterogeneous at the surface. As you go deeper, the heterogeneity reduces somewhat, but it's still uh, a characteristic. And this is what's causing that, that high scattering field that, that you see on some of these seismograms. Uh, we're able to uh, image uh, VS, V, VP and some variations in Q as well. So we have a sense of what the attenuation structure is. And we have a 3D model in both P and S that we can now calculate uh, using waveform codes uh, to try to see how well we're, the model is actually doing. Uh, one thing to note before I, before I go into that is uh, the precision of the model and the, the heterogeneity is, is enough that we can already start to make some, uh, some assessments of what this model is telling us. Now, if you can see them in, in these, uh, these dots here, these cyan dots are the catalog seismicity uh, that was given to us by the Folger Consulting uh, Company. And you can see uh, these dots don't scatter randomly across the plot, even though they, they had nothing to do with the 3D model we, we, we've calculated here. Uh, but they do show us that the seismicity tends to fall in between the high and the below, low velocities, where the gradient is the highest. So we can already start to make, with these types of models, some prediction of where we would expect microseismicity to be. It would be at these suture zones be, between uh, the high and the low velocities. You can actually see some of the seismicity swimming around these uh, high velocity bodies in, in certain places. Uh, so how well does the model actually do? Uh, and again, the, the, way, the way to characterize this is what portion of the waveform are we actually calculating and is it doing better than the one-dimensional model? So this is that re really noisy trace we were looking at earlier, which uh, again, I, I assume an analyst would probably ignore except for the initial P arrival. Uh, here in green is the synthetic for the one-dimensional model that I showed earlier. And you can see it's a very poor, pit, poor fit to this particular trace. Uh, but when you calculate it through the 3D model, we can now start to really identify where all this scattering is coming from and you can see the variations in scattering from different sites. So this, this is a trace for this NB19 station. It's got a long uh, trail of coda. If you picked uh, this station up here, it would be very uh, compact, very little scattering uh, because of the path that that's taking. And this model takes both of those into account. Um, <clears throat> and we can use these subtle changes now that we've got a, a waveform that's uh, precise enough that we can start to look at some of these other features um, in, in the waveform, instead of just using the P and the S picks, uh, we can start to use more of the actual uh, waveform field. So here's an example. This uh, red line here is a synthetic for the catalog location. Black is the actual, um, actual waveform. And you can see they did a fairly good job. It's not perfect, but it did, does a pretty good job of uh, the waveform. This is a different earthquake, by the way. Um, 
<clears throat> but you can see this P arrival is almost identical to this one, which is for a synthetic where the, where the event is moved up by 250 meters. So for this particular, um, this particular station, this P and this S arrival do not differentiate uh, 250 meters in depth between these uh, two locations. And if you move it down 250 meters, there's not a whole lot of change in the P arrival either. So precise measurements of these P and S arrivals are required. And even if you have those precise uh, measurements, uh, you don't have as much information as you could potentially get. And so what we find uh, doing this type of analysis is, you know, in this case, if you move it deeper, you can actually start to interpret some of these later arrivals that are coming in. You can actually start to say, oh, there's an arrival here. It's still not perfect, so we can move it around a little bit, but we can start to really uh, collapse down those uh, uncertainty uh, intervals. So, let's see, I have uh, two minutes left, so I'll try to go rapidly over this, and I apologize for that. Uh, so one of the things that we're interested in also beyond uh, just the uh, seismicity is also knowing what the moment tensors for these events are. And you can actually, again, use these waveforms to invert not just for location but also for the moment tensor of these events. But beyond that, we can use uh, a second type of interferometry where we, um, we correlate the waveforms of different uh, microseisms with one another um, and see what sort of... Uh, what sort of measurements we can make on those to try to discriminate um, different types of faulting mechanisms. So again, the reason we're doing this, if all the faults are along a trend but the slip is not, is not a conjunction with that, you might be looking at a series of on echelon faults. It might be a lesser uh, concern to you. But if they're all lined up with each other and the slip is all along this path, you might say, well, maybe this is a fault that we need to be concerned about. Uh, so how are you going to differentiate that? So uh, one of the things we're doing when we do this correlation is we get a measurement of the correlation time. So what you're looking at here is if we scattered seismometers just across, randomly across the surface of this uh, geothermal field and you did this correlation between two different micro seisms, in this case they're only separated by 50 meters, what would you see? Well, in arrival time, if one is above the other, what you see is this uh, a characteristic bullseye pattern. So this is telling you which event is above the other one and where they are relative to each other uh, in time space anyway. And if they're laterally offset from each other, you'll see a very different pattern from that. So this again, that this helps you locate uh, pretty rapidly uh, two events that are very close to each other but are discriminated uh, by their uh, correlation waveform, the, the travel times in them. And one of the things people usually pick out is, is these scattering of blue points in here and they say, well, what is that? And does this mean the method doesn't work? Well, what that is is that you're actually starting to see uh, a measure of the um, Moen tensor as well. So this, instead of looking at the travel time uh, result between these correlations, what you're looking at is the relative amplitude, the sign of the amplitude of those correlations, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. And what you see is all the, po or all the positives are plotting here, all the negatives are here, and here it's pretty neutral. You're not seeing everything. That's where that line of points was showing up. And what this is, is the actual fault plane. This is a synthetic test, so we know that this is the fault plane between those two. So again, a very simple measurement of this correlation function uh, gives you not just the relative locations between these two events, but the relative moment tensor between the two. And once you have that, you can start to say, is this moment tensor changing as, uh, as uh, the seismicity evolves? Is this something, again, that we need to be concerned about? And, um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, this is a uh, work in progress, and we've got a lot more to say, but not on today's, because we've got four seconds left. Thanks. So it's time for questions. So how are you answering the question? Is this something we should worry about? Uh, so that was a synthetic test. And Oh, the, the question was, how are we answering the question, is this something to be concerned about? The part of the talk that I haven't gotten to in this that, that is part of this study is we're doing a hydromechanical modeling on top of this. So we're using the microseismicity to characterize the subsurface. And what that does is it takes the information on the slip functions and on the evolution of the microseismicity over time to then predict uh, 
what do we expect if we inject a little, inject more into the surface, this is what we expect the microseismicity to be doing. And that's, a ba that's based on uh, both the uh, moment tensors and on the locations of the microseisms. And as the system evolves, that inversion actually adds new information. So you might see, actually I have a figure, I don't know if, oh, there it is. Uh, what you might do is initially you might have very little understanding of the subsurface, all of your points are along a line, you say, okay, here's roughly my fault. But as you get more information, you might say, well, wait a minute, there's a pattern going on here. There's, there's, there's a series of events. Is this something I need to be concerned about? And as that evolves, it adds more in. So this is, this is in development as well, but I, I can't go into the details in this particular venue. So 